Living Seed Media brings to you God's Word, which is His comprehensive equipment for changing lives. May the Lord impact your heart as you encounter His Word. For further inquiry or counsel, contact Peace House, P.O. Box 971, Boko, Benue State, Nigeria. Telephone numbers 0703 036369 0703 768 98 Email address lsmedia at or visit our website at www.livingseed.org Let us sit back and listen as the servant of God brings forth the word of life. Tonight, I will now begin to look at bonus, typical bonus of a reviver, typical bonus of a reviver. Those that did not allow the fire to quench, those that worked in such a way that the purpose of God did not dissipate under their hands. How did they respond? What are the peculiar issues that they, they responded to that made what would have appeared as ordinary to explode? What did they do? that brought such a dimension onto the grace of God that they carried. And I do say this tonight from a firm conviction that the men that God ever used, they were not different from people like us. The men that shook their generation. Maybe they did not know more than we do. The men and the women that blazed the fire of revival and gave dimension to the word of God that they had and they have studied, may I say that many of them, they were not even as old as we are. Some of them are not as old in the Lord as we are. One of the prayers I'm praying at the end of this meeting is that God will set you on fire. And that your life will begin to make many in the kingdom of God, in our own generation, in the name of Jesus Christ. And for this evening, I just want to explore typical bonus of a revival. Typical bonus. And because my first concern tonight is to just to explore them, just to help us study as we look through scriptures. And we begin to see what is peculiar about this typical bonus that the fire that came on their lives did not quench with them. I am doing that in order to draw issues that I'm hoping that God will help me and you to respond to in the coming days, in our own time, in our own generation and in our own circumstances in the name of Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2. Are you already in Acts chapter 2? Eh? Alright. Now, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. 
And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and they were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews, and proselytes, Cretes, and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed. And they were in doubt, saying one to another, What minute this? Others, mocking, said, These men are full of new wine. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said to them, Ye men of Judea, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known to you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken, as you suppose. Seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which prophet Joel, which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams and on my servants and on my handmaidens I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall all I mean they shall prophesy and I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great a notable day of the Lord come, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourself also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken, and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holding by it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I shall not be moved. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let me read a little more. The passage is long, but it's very interesting because it's quite an history and yet a great account. Now, would you like us to jump? Jump to verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were preached in their hearts and they said to Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? 
Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together. And had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods. And parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved praise the Lord you will notice that if if we have all the time it will have just been beautiful to keep reading and read the whole story. Go to chapter 3, go to chapter 4, go to chapter 5. Very great story. But that, as wonderful as it is, will only take all our time within the space we have. But there are highlights, issues that we want to deal with, we want to look at typical bonus of a revival. What is peculiar about them? What is it that is in their lives that we need to see now that we have arrived at the point at which God must release us to act? Now, let me begin by noting, let me begin by noting that when the day of Pentecost was fully come and the mighty rushing wind that the Bible described was coming all the way from heaven, and though the Bible reported and said suddenly there came a mighty rushing wind from heaven, let me note with you very quickly that Every outpouring that is coming from heaven has a particular address. Please take note. Every outpouring of the Spirit of God that is coming from heaven, even though it is going to affect many people, even though it is going to create effect that may become worldwide, but its launching pad is not usually worldwide. It's not usually everywhere. It has a clearly demarcated address. And I must need to emphasize that as a very critical beginning of what we are talking about because many, many times people are expecting revival, they are expecting the move of God, they are expecting the power of God, but they are vague. They are vague in their expectation. They are vague in their response because they think that when the spirit will come, it will just fall everywhere. 
May I quickly say that the spirit does not fall everywhere. But what happens that you sense the move of the spirit everywhere is the effect or the response of the burners. You are not getting me. You are not getting me yet. When God releases the Holy Ghost from above, in an outpouring, at any time, in any place, that has culminated into a move of God that has spread over lands and nations, it does not first scatter itself everywhere. It doesn't go to the market, for example. It goes to a waiting host. It goes to a host of men and women that have been prepared, waiting for that outpouring. Now, but if that outpouring will end in the small house, if it will quench in the little environment where it came, it is not the weakness of the Holy Spirit that God poured forth. It will be the lack of a proper response by the burners. I don't know whether I have made a statement. Is it clear to you? Is it clear? All right. What do I mean by that? What's the implication of what I'm saying? Now, do you notice that even in the Acts of Apostles here, the house where these 120 of them were gathered, the Bible said, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, there were, they were all, where? Please. They were all scattered all over the world. Eh? They were in different, different lands. And so when the Spirit was coming, he was looking for them everywhere. Say said, yes, uh, uh, in the market. Uh, no. What did the Bible say? They were all in one place. They were all with one accord in one place. Now, can I ask two questions quickly? Do you think the house where they were sitting, do you think it was an isolated house in a wilderness such that no matter how, when the Holy Spirit was coming, it has no alternative than to fall on that house? Please talk to me, please. What do you think would be the, the scenario? Who knows what would be the scenario? Stand up and talk. What, would, what do you think would be? Yes, Brother Andy Yek. Uh huh. Yes. Uh huh. Yes. Sure that the houses are of the same structure, yeah. same design, and so on and so forth. All right. So I'm thinking that this house must have been just submerging such a quarter. So it was not something that was peculiar or outstanding, that was different. Okay. Okay. So, which means, from what our brother is saying, like we're here now, there are many roofs, isn't it? many roofs and our house is only but one of the roofs how did the rushing wind i want you to hear me <laughs> let me tell you one of my stories when we were growing up in my father's house i cannot tell you how many times how many times we slept only to wake up and discover that a very terrible wind and a very terrible rain 
had come and has carried away our roof. Only to wake up and discover that we are under <laughs> open sky. Sometime when the wind will blow our roof, and I'm telling you, I cannot remember how many times. It was a regular occurrence. This was why now, when Adebisi see his roofing, our house is now. I used to respect his wisdom that when they have put all the wall plates, all this thing, then they will go and get, what do they call it? Barbed wire. And they will put this barbed wire, they will drill the wall and tie it at many, many, many points. I was wondering how they came about that. Maybe the experiences of my father's house has taught the carpenters. We will wake up and the whole place will just be clear sky and rain will be falling on us. Then we will start looking for where our zinc has been carried. Of course, when they have try to gather. They say, I think this is your own thing. Because it could carry about five houses at the same time. And sometimes as it's carrying our own roof, you go and land it somewhere else. Wah! Another person's roof will come and land somewhere. Wah! It used to be a terrible confusion. And we will all pack out, pack out, pack out and then carpenters will come and they will start knocking again, knocking again, knocking again. Sometime in two, in one year, we lost our roof twice. Those were the travails we grew under. So when my father had money now to build a house with mud, and he was going to get zinc, and he was saying, what do you do so that wind will not carry this? <laughs> because again, they were fetish. They were fetish. They also believed that this wind, that somebody sent the wind. <laughs> so I noticed that when we were moving to the new house, there was a special shrine that Baba went and planted in the compound. He said, This one is the diverter of strange winds and storms. <laughs> And until I repented, I put my faith in that thing. If anybody is, you know, sometimes we are clearing the yard and you are nearing the place and you want to, you want to remove the weeds, you say, don't go near there, don't go near there. That is the keeper of the roof. <laughs> we try to make sure that you don't touch it. Until when I finally gave my life to Christ, I went there and said, look, this thing, it can't be keeping anything. And I knock it. Papa said, what do you do like that? If, you, if, if, this, if the wind comes now, what are we going to do? I said, no. I think we need to tie this roof very well. <laughs> now, why am I telling you that story? I realized that this particular mighty rushing wind must be peculiar. Because if it is ordinary wind, wind does not know which house to fall on and which house to omit. If it is a rushing mighty wind, I expected that it will have sat on many houses. Am I right? But in this case, when it was coming all the way from heaven, it was giving a particular address to go. There are houses here, there are houses here, there are houses there, there are houses there. And yet the Holy Spirit did not fall on any of them. Why? There was a clear direction. A clear location. And the location, may I inform you, is not the house. It is the heads that are gathered in that house. 
Oh, you are not hearing me. Do you know there is another house where people are gathering for celebration? People were there also. But the spirit did not go there because they were not correct heads on which the spirit of God is looking to rest. Do you remember that some time ago we were looking at Jesus during his baptism? And we also noted that the Bible said, and while he was baptized, straight away, the heavens were what? Opened to him. And the Spirit of God did what? Descended and rested upon him like a dove. And we understood that it is possible for 10 people to be crowded in a place. And when the heavens open, heavens is not open to all the ten. It opens to only one. And when the Spirit of God was descending, he descended just on that head that had been marked at for that assignment. Now, that's the first thing I would like to note. Worldwide revivals. Mighty manifestation of the grace and power of God as and it could spread all over the world in its beginning, in its outburst, is usually located and sometimes localized. But the spread only depends on those lives on which the Spirit of God did what? Rested. I will note that now. Have we noted that? Oh my God, have you noted that? So the implication of this is that a worldwide revival, something that has capacity to overwhelm the whole world, can usually begin in a room. What we affect the entire generation of men does not need to gather a big crowd before it starts. It can actually start with few heads on which the Spirit of God decided to settle. That's a typical issue I don't want you to forget. And I want to say that in all the mighty revivals that the Holy Spirit had occasioned, whether in the Old Testament or even in this New Testament or in contemporary times, whether the ones we have read about in, in, during John Wesley, during Jonathan Edwards or Charles Finney or the Hebrides revival, or the Welsh Revival, or the Indonesian Revival, all the move of God that we could report, we could read about, they all have this typical beginning. Always began in a house where some certain people have gathered, where some certain people have been prepared, where some certain lives have been particularly signaled out as the carriers of that fire. So, what does that say about those of us sitting here? I want to also say, never you think it is incredible for God to start something in this place that will have a worldwide effect. Have I said something that is clear to you? Don't think it is incredible. And don't imagine that we are saying something that is strange or something that has never happened before or something that God has never done before. That God could want to do something that will turn the whole of Nigeria, 
that will turn the whole of West Africa, that, that will spread to all of Africa, that will go to Asia, that will get to America, and get to United Kingdom and Europe, and get to Australia, and get to the, the Latin America, Brazil, and all of that. Never you imagine that it is incredible for such a move of God to find its embryonic beginning in a place like here. Is it incredible? If it is not incredible, I would like to first lay it before you that the typical bonus of revivers that have become global they were men like you. I don't know whether you are hearing me. Typical bonus of revivers that have swept the whole world. Many of them, they were not different from people like you and like myself. And may I first of all ask God to reveal to you the possibility of a move of God even by your own life and by your own hand. What am I saying to you? You! And let me tell somebody, do you know you, you sitting here could be an agent of a worldwide move of God? Please. Please, please. Don't say it casually. Don't say it casually. Don't say it casually. I want you to believe me. Do you know that you sitting here, it is not incredible that God could have elected you as an instrument of a global revival? One of the things that we must never overlook in the bonus is that they were men like ourselves. One of the things that I want God to make clear before I go away from that scripture this night is that because of the great works that a move of God normally produces, because of the great effect that the Holy Spirit usually brings about, it used to overwhelm us as to imagine that the men and women that were used were superb. It used to make it look as if they are in a, a different class and that people like us, we cannot be used like that because we are not in their class. But may I say to you, what the effect of every move of God brings about is a different issue. The bonus, the people that God decided to make use of, they were usually of the same stock like any one of us. So, can I say to you what I quietly believe? Would you like me to tell you what I quietly believe? I quietly believe. And I remember some years ago, there was one challenge that came to me and I couldn't run away from it. I quietly believe that there is no difference between me and John Wesley. I quietly believe. I quietly believe that what is what is what is Wesley? Wesley is a name. Am I right? It could be Akani.
Am I right? You are not talking to me again. You could be a canny. When they talked about Evan Roberts, I said, What is robot? Robot makes no meaning in my Yoruba language. We don't call anybody robot. And if you were to write it in our local language, it would be a bad name. We write it Roboti. Eh? It will be called Roboti. And we will say Keninja Robot. It makes no sense. But it became a name that people are talking about. Why? God. Identify with that ordinary man. And they affected their generation. So I quietly believe. I quietly believe. I am very, very persuaded that even me, as the Lord liveth, and if he is not a respecter of persons, which I know he is not, as he is dealing with my life, and as he's putting his hand on my life and say, I want to use you, I quietly believe that I also could be mentioned, not because I want to be mentioned, but I could be mentioned as one man among several that God used to blaze the fire of revival in my generation. I don't know whether you believe like that, but that's what I quietly believed. I quietly believed that if God sent the Spirit and he went to a house where all these barbarians were, and it pleases God, that what he began with them has remained up to now. I quietly believe that if God used a Peter and used Brother Paul and they wrote letters and people's lives were affected permanently and there was nothing about them apart from that it was God who worked in them I quietly believe that it is not incredible for God. Since Paul is dead, since Peter cannot be got here again, since John Wesley is gone, and since a living dog is better than, than a dead lion, I quietly believe that it is not incredible for God to locate my life as a vessel for revival in my generation. I believe that. I believe that. Because I believe that, I could stand and say, Oh God, if you are the one who used men of old, if their generation were affected by them, because you walked in their lives. Why not me? Why not me? Why not me? There's something again I quietly believed. Can I tell you what I again quietly believed? Eh? When I saw that the men that God used to shake their generation, they were not men of substance. They were not men that have money. They were not men that anybody talked about seriously. Oh God. They were ordinary people who came from nowhere. And they were not older than me. This faith that I'm talking to you has been with me for some years. Old. 
And I saw that some of them, they were in their 20s. Some of them, they struck their generation when they were 27, 28. Some of them, before they turned 40, their nation has already been shaking. I say, oh God. So I constructed a song for myself that time. I will serve my Jesus while I am young. I will serve my Jesus while I am young. I quietly believed that age was not a disadvantage to them and it cannot be to me. I quietly believe that what was not a disadvantage to them Money was not. So lack of money will not be my own disadvantage. I quietly believe that. This night, I want to ask you, do you believe that even you, as the Lord liveth, as the Lord liveth, can be one among several that God could turn his attention upon and say for this sake for this reason were you born from your mother's womb I want to tell you something simple because of this thing that I believed I have seen a little of what God can do with a life. I've seen a little. But on this point in which I stand today, something is happening in my spirit that is saying, the little you saw before is nothing compared with what you are about to see. Are you hearing me? Do you know? Do you know? That even now, as, as little as we, have, we are, even now, even now, there is no city in Nigeria first that I will go. And I will be stranded as I'm talking to you now. And sometime I wanted to test it. Not because I want to test it, but I wanted to test it. <laughs> and I will sit quietly in a vehicle. And the driver will, I mean, the the, the policeman or someone said, stop there, stop there. And I'm sitting down quietly. And they're interrogating the brother who is driving. Come down here. And occasionally, I will just say something. Maybe I'll just say, Femi, what are they asking? And I will not know that that thing I've said the inspector sitting down there say, excuse me, who is speaking like Brother Bile there? <laughs> and Femi will clearly say, yes, he's the one. And the man will say, what? How can we stop my, my father in the Lord on the road? We are sorry, sir. We are sorry, sir. You don't know me. I have never met you. But your messages has affected me. I don't miss your message every 7.30 a.m. Sunday. We're sorry, sir. Please go. Please go. And we have been cleared. And I'm wondering, what is Billy? The 
that it will affect anybody. Nothing. He came from the village. My father did not leave me any inheritance except a pair of oversized shoes. <laughs> I'm telling you. So forget about it. Forget about it. Stop talking to me about, hey, I don't have something. What did I have? When they gave me these oversized shoes, that, that's all my father left for me. I put my leg in it, it could not size. I just threw it away. To face my life, to face the purpose of God, to face the calling of God on my life, The call of God on my life is authentic. So, for us to be talking about a global move of God, may I say to you, it is not incredible that it can start even with you. There's somebody. It's not incredible for God to use me. Yes. Let's settle that first before we go. Let's agree that what made those bonus, the prominence that God gave them, it's not because they were prominent in themselves. It's because God decided to walk through them. And if God did, why not I? One of the questions you will pray with me over tonight is why not I? Why not I? Why not I? What makes them useful? And you are pushing me aside. Lord, why? And if there's anything, were you not the one who walked in them to overcome their difficulties? Have you lost your power to walk in a man like me? Walk in my life. Walk in my life. That's the first thing. This typical bonus. The Holy Spirit locates them. He localizes them. They could be in a village. They could be in a bush. They could be ordinary people. But they are a waiting host. What people didn't know is that three and a half years before Pentecost, Jesus Jesus went on the street. He was calling them. He was calling them. He was calling them. Secretly, people didn't know what he was going to do with them. He called Peter. He called Thomas. He called Matthew. He called different of them. And little by little, he was moving up and down with them. And people were wondering, what is he doing with all these dear, 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 dear people that are wearing a badachomba everywhere? What will come out of this kind of people? These are people that cannot even reach. But Jesus was firm. I will make you fishers of men. And what will affect the whole world? And I want to tell you that what has happened through these brothers is what has not stopped until now. Am I right? Oh, so I want to tell you, it is not incredible. It's not incredible that God will flow through you and through me as it pleases him. And I want you to stop thinking. Stop thinking in your mind that the kind of things that happen to them is so big that we cannot experience it in our time. Stop that. That's the first critical word for me tonight. 
And the last thing I want to say on what I believe, I'm saying it not because I need to be doing that, but I'm saying it because I can see in this meeting today, I can see young people, some have just turned 20, some are now 24, 25, some are now 26, 27. Listen, I want to tell you something. Are you listening to me? Please hear me. The tendency when you are staying with people that are a little older or people that are advanced for years is to think in your mind that you couldn't do what they did because you are not as old. Eh? The tendency is for you to imagine in your heart me, I'm still a small boy. I can't do anything. I cannot cause anything to happen because I'm a small boy. Let me inform you. All the people that God mightily manifested his glory in their lives, they were not ancient of days. They were not Methuselahs. Am I communicating with somebody? They were like you when God grabbed them. And if I were to remind you, people like us, I was telling some of our children the other time, because it bothers me that I now have children that have grown up, they're now in their twenties, and they want me to be pampering them as if they are babies. Sometimes I like to tell them that, do you know, at your, at your own age, when I was at your age, I've already lost my father. I have nobody to cry to. I cry to the Father in heaven. It's not a big matter. I wanted to remind them, I said, do you know that people like us, we came for NYC. We came to serve. And as we were serving, we were going up and down in the village. And we were saying, oh God, give me this land. So may I say to you that some of you went to serve somewhere and you came back to come and sit down again and you are eating apple in your mother's compound. You are not serious. That at this age, after you have done NYC, you have not caught a vision for life. Somebody still need to tell you how not to dress. Ah, you are not serious. Let me inform you, you are old enough to bring revival. Will you let me tell somebody? Say, do you know you are old enough to cause a worldwide move of God. <laughs> when God will give me space, because I'm, beligi- I'm beginning to see that it's critical now for me to focus on the young people. And we need to talk. We need to talk. Because the prime of your years is irretrievable. If you do not strike at your prime, 
There is nothing to prime you again. Hallelujah. And as we are dealing with discipleship as a preparation to be used of God, the need to recognize that the mighty rushing wind was not going to the market when I fell on people and they are people of your age. There are people that God just laid hold on. Some were in the village, some were in town, some were ordinary, and at the same time, may I say, some were very educated. All that matters is that the Holy Ghost came on their lives. Praise the Lord. Have we got the very critical point we have raised tonight. Eh? Some of us say, ah, is that all we are going to talk about? That's a very critical point. Now, let me now trace it. Can I now trace it? When the Holy Ghost came and selected this waiting host, 120 of them, and sat on each one of them. The first response of the community, and I want all of you to hear me, because community have never changed. They have never changed, and they will not change. As soon as the Holy Ghost came down, and something strange is happening in the lives of these people that were in that upper room. They did something that was not decent. So again, I want to say, don't be afraid of doing things that are not decent when you are seeking a breakthrough. How do I make my point? I want to make a point quickly because bonus they are not first regimented and regulated. When fire is burning in somebody, honestly speaking, you cannot organize him. Oh my God. I'm confusing you now. You see, as soon as the Holy Ghost came on their lives, the Bible said they were all speaking at once. Everybody was speaking. Can you imagine 120 people all speaking at once? And they were all talking, not one after another. And they were speaking different languages. You can imagine how they were behaving. You can imagine how the noise that was going out of that room was such a confused noise. It was because what they were doing was strange. That is what drew the attention of the people to the place. Do you remember? It was when it was noised abroad that the people began to come and say, what's happening in that place? 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 And as a result of this, some people saw them and said, ah, are they not all Galileans? How is it that we are hearing them speak in our own mother tongue? I'm coming to deal with that when I come to number three point. That's not what I want to deal with. At the, as they were looking at them, they said they are drunk. Do you remember that? Some people just mocked them. Some people just concluded that they are drunk. Listen. Many people want the Holy Ghost. 
Many people want the fire to fall. But they also want to be decent. You're not hearing me. They also want to be what? Decent and organized. That when fire comes, they will be in good shape to stand and say, fire, we welcome you. This is how we normally do things. So join the queue. And they would like to organize the fire. And said, Sister, I'm wasting. Wow. You have just received your fire, have you? Stand up now and, and talk to us. Why talk about your husband? She wait for his own turn. Let me ask you, if fire falls on this roof now, and we saw some of the rafters burning, will you be sitting like this? No. Eh? What is going to happen immediately? This place will scatter. You will see all kind of animal behavior. Because fire is here. And the people are sincere. Those are the, in fact, if somebody is standing by the roadside, somebody will do what? Push him and say, get out, get out. You don't know that. Fire, fire. Now, let me say, one of the things that did not allow some of us to experience an outburst of the fire is because we are over doctrinized. We are over worried about decency. I am not preaching in decency. Are you hearing me? I am not asking you to go and be misbehaving. No. But I want to tell you every outbreak of fire disorganizes. Every outbreak of the spirit raises serious disorganization in human arrangements. And those who cannot, who cannot endure a disarrangement of their arrangements, they will quickly quench the fire of the spirit. Don't cause confusion here. That's not how we do it. That's not how we move here. May I say to you, I am ready for another disorganization of Peace House. If Peace House has become too regimented as not to allow some of you to break forth, you are not hearing me. You see, a good work can come to a good level that it does not make room for the interruption of the Spirit of God again. You are not hearing me, no. May peace house not become so organized that the Holy Spirit will not be able to interrupt things. I didn't hear anybody saying amen. amen. Maybe because you like organization. Maybe because you like everybody to move like this. Whenever you see somebody well organized, it's about dying. Whenever you see 
light sprouting, 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 fire burning. One of the first things that baffles elderly people is that this thing is scattering all that we have put together. And I was beginning to see why is it that those that have advanced in age they are unable to carry along the young people is because they cannot endure the exuberant disorganization that comes with fire. They are not able to accept something that is moving and dis disarranging all that we thought was rigid. May I ask you this night, bonus, they were not afraid to do new things and to be termed as strange. Don't be afraid to be called strange. Hallelujah. Amen. Don't be afraid that people will say, ah, why is he doing something strange? What has become normal today when it started? What was it? Strange. <laughs> you don't know. You don't know that I was already in this land when the issue of the Holy Ghost was still a problem. You don't know. I was in Kasnala and <laughs> we wanted to minister the Holy Ghost. And the students, many of the students, they were very serious. They want the power of God. But they were senior friends who said, no, 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 no. That's a controversial issue. Don't bring controversial issue here. Holy Ghost is controversial issue. When men are dying, the very power of God become controversial. And I remember, I was so concerned about the way everything is arranged that even myself, I was arranging the message in such a way that there will be no problem, that nothing will break out. I will talk and talk. I say, you need power. I will say it like that. But instead of saying, come and receive power, I will say, well, you know, God is going to bless you. Nothing. I finished the first day, the second day, the third day. Some student came to me and said, sir, we read in the Bible that when the Holy Ghost come upon you, they shall speak in tongues. What about that? I said, you know, it's there. But we have to be careful because anytime I saw some of the senior friends, my mom would be doing that. <laughs> because I've seen them sitting down there. One of those days, it was not, I didn't plan it all because it left for me, I don't want problem. I don't want this organization. But as I started speaking, I had not landed when I heard a sister just fell down. And she was, you know, for me, for me, sweating, crying at the same time. Rolling on the ground. My first problem, senior friends. I was wishing that this thing didn't happen here. 
before I will know another person, another person, another person, another person. And they were not receiving the Holy Ghost decently. Some, the way the thing came on them, some were on the ground rolling. Some were beating chair. Others were violently vibrating. They have not known how to allow the spirit to give them utterance. They are <laughs> I say it don't happen now. <laughs> the meeting turned. People went on praying. The Holy Ghost came. I knew I'm going to have a problem. Some of those big men came and said, Yes. Why are you causing confusion? I said, me, I didn't cause confusion. Oh. What did I do? Say, so we saw you are forcing our children to speak in tongues. I said, ah, I didn't. I didn't. I wish I was bolder. I wish I stood more. So I called the brethren and I said, yes, it's the Holy Ghost, it's the Holy Ghost. But the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Subject to the prophet. Even though the Holy Spirit is in you, keep doing it inside. Keep doing it inside. Don't make noise with it. No way. No way. At another meeting, buru, 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 buru. Ah. The beginning of persecution. He's doing a strength thing. He's forcing our children to receive the Spirit. He's forcing them to speak in tongues. He's doing this. He's doing that. He's doing that. Hallelujah. But you know today, is this strange again? It's no more strange. Now I see people, they sing in tongues. They even pray in tongues in the microphone. Nobody worries. Why? Everything that has become a norm today was a strange thing in their beginning. I'm telling you a story before we go. So when the Holy Ghost came on these brothers and sisters in the upper room, if they were still sitting quietly like this, I don't think anybody from the city will rush here. It was because they were making a, a terrible noise. It's like fire was burning in that house. And people ran and said, go there, go and check what is happening to them. Now we don't know. Ah, Only for them to be dumbfounded. As they saw people speaking in their own native language. Are we ready for strange things again? Don't be afraid to be tagged strange. Every revival move of God was always called strange when it begins. It is as it progresses and people begin to touch the benefit of it that they will begin to settle and say it is the Lord's. It is the Lord's work. Let's allow it. Let's allow it. Let's allow it. Bonus, typical bonus of revival. They were tagged strange because what was happening in their lives was actually strange. It was not the norm. It was not the continuation of the ordinary routine. It was a move of God. This night, will you deliberately, deliberately, Enlarge your heart and say, Father, whatever you want to do with me, 
in spearheading the move of God in my time. Come and do it again. Hallelujah. There's going to be a difference between this and the other one. Many times that God released fire, most of those brothers didn't have anybody they can look up to. They didn't have anybody to guide them. So, they were responding on the spur of the moment. And some of them went to extremes that discredited the revival. But thank God that there is enough help God has gathered around us for the coming move of God. This one will last. This one will endure. In the name of Jesus Christ. Some of you will be termed as mad. Because the kind of things you will see God wanting to break through in your life to do. They will say, no! We don't do that here. Let's do it as we used to do it so that it can continue to be as it used to be. Revival is not about doing what it used to be. It's about a divine interruption. Mockery is part of revival. What did I say? Mockery. They mock them. They love them to scorn. They look at them as people that were strange. But something that didn't die in them is the fire that nobody could quench. So I'm telling you, these burners, they were not afraid to do things that appear indecent. They were not afraid to break out of the norm to allow God to do something in their lives that others regarded as strange. Even though the knowledge of the word of God has come to us and we thank God for what the Holy Spirit has been teaching us over the years. But I would like to note that the advent, the advent of the fire of revival first and foremost comes to reshuffle things. And even though things will settle, it never settles back to what it used to be. And because we have arrived at a point that God is saying, I want to move now. It's time to face this land and to do it deliberately. Not to joke with what God wants to do with you now. Don't think it is strange that in the school where you are a student or where you are a teacher, don't think it is strange if the Spirit of God should break forth in you and ask you to reach these children. And as you are reaching them, God breaks forth on their lives. Don't be afraid. It's normal. It's normal. It is strange, but it's not abnormal. Hallelujah. Now, the people said they were drunk. Now, this is the third point. The bonus, the typical bonus. They did not ignore or take for granted what God is doing in their lives. 
you know that little point I'm raising? It might be a little difficult to quickly explain, but I want to say now that what could have become a great move of God quenched because the men that God wanted to use they accepted the interpretation of people about what they carried and they began to doubt what God is doing in their lives. They began to doubt what God has started in them to the point that they are saying, I am not sure. I'm not sure it is from God. I'm not sure let me not just do anything. And because they began to doubt their own experience of God, it did not spread. Do you know that some of you are sitting here that something happened to you? But because you were afraid or you did not believe or you doubted it, you quenched it. You quenched it. The Spirit of God was doing something in you. But something said, ah! Mm -mm. People will say. People will say. People will say. And so, because you don't want people to say, what did you do? What did you do? You quenched it and said, mm-mm. Mm-mm. But I want to note with you that what became a worldwide move of God that started in the day of Pentecost will have ended in verse 30. It will have ended in that verse 30. And what will have been the conclusion? These men are full of what? New wine, don't mind them, they are drunk. They are drunk. But you see, Peter, and I would like to say to you, it was because Peter stood up with the 11 that we had the response in verse 37. I want you to note this. If Peter had sat back and said, well, People say we are drunk. Even we ourselves, we don't know why we are speaking the way we are speaking. But we know we are not drunk, but we don't know what it is. But if it appears like drunkenness to you people, it's okay. We don't know why God is even making us drunk like this. Do you know that the whole thing will have ended? It will not have become anything. I would like to say the bonus that God used to spread the fire of revival, they believed in what God is doing in their lives. They were tenacious with it. Even though it couldn't be explained. But they did not allow people to misexplain it to them. When I'm about to conclude this point, I will tell you a few things before we stop for tonight. Peter stood up, lifted up his voice, and said to them, Ye men of Judea, on all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known to you and akin to my words. Hi, where did Peter get that boldness? That was Peter. That before a small girl, just about six weeks ago, said I never knew him. But this time, be it known to you, all of you that dwell in Jerusalem, all of you that came from Judea, akin to my words. For these are not drunken as you suppose. 
saying it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Ah, I was wondering. You know, in one of our retreats, I had spent time on this matter before. But we have come to it again, but from a new perspective. I said we would never have seen John the Baptist. He would never have become what he became, except that when he read the word of God in Isaiah 40, there was a witness in his heart. That passage is what I came to fulfill. And as he began to declare it, as he began to declare it, God was honoring his word. Hallelujah. Now, we have come to this chapter and this man stood up and said, let it be known to you. This is that which Joy spoke about. Ah, how could Peter claim that what is happening to them is what Joel prophesied about many years ago? How could he do that? Now listen, brothers and sisters, let me tell you. One of the things that has quenched revival fire is the inferiority complex of those who are supposed to be the burners. The inferiority that tells you in your heart that what we are doing is inferior to what the Bible said. And as a result of that inferiority, what could have become a mighty move of God? We have quenched it. Because something tells us it is not that. When Peter stood and said, this is that. What we are doing here is biblical. The way you see us speaking and prophesying and speaking in tongues and it appears to you like noise. It is correct. This is what Joe said will happen. Huh? How could he claim that? That God said in the days of Joel, in the last days I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Huh? Upon all flesh. Listen to me. Listen to me, please. The book of Joel said, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. But we are in a small room. Eh? How can Peter believe that this that is happening in this small room is equal to what Joel prophesied that will happen upon all flesh? You know what Peter believed? Peter believed that. Even if it will be on, upon all flesh, it has a beginning point, And we are the beginners of it. I told you some few things that I believed. But if I'm talking it, in the beginning, when I, I, I used to say it, it made many more people to hate me. <coughs> it made many more pastors to misunderstand me. It made many big, big senior people to put me aside and say, don't mind him. But I knew in my spirit one of the things I told some of our evangelists and pastors and Pentecostal leaders that time was that I was very, very convinced in my heart that what God is telling us to do will spread all over the world. And they look and they say, this dreamer. 
this dreamer. We had gone for conferences and they would talk, talk, talk. When, I, when they asked me to come and stand up to speak, I would bring them back and say, unless the corn of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. Some say, you don't even know more than this death, 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 something. If we allow this brother to be preaching to our people, he will just bring the spirit of death on all of them. I have suffered here. Somebody stood up and said, look, our people are poor because of the way you are preaching to them. All this cry, 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 cry. You know? You want just to... And I'm looking at this, but I say, can't you see the word of God? Can't you see that this is the only way it can happen? So I say, we know, we see it, but we don't want that. And I'm watching them. But because they were, they look big. They formed an association. I used to attend the meeting. But when they are ready to talk, and they communicate me like this. They will just push me somewhere and they will talk. And they made it appear as if I was a strange man. I was a man that is confused. And I had to go back again many times in my prayer. I'm crying to God, Lord, why is it like this? It takes God to keep reminding me, this is the truth. This is the way. Walk in it. Many revivers and many burners have quenched because men made them to feel inferior with what God is doing in their lives. Many fire that could have become mighty were quenched because of inferiority sense that was pushed on those burners. Now, Peter stood up and said, this. What you are calling drunkenness is that we just spoke about. And he went on and quoted. Let me tell you how he quoted it. I deliberately read it because I wanted to see what he quoted. He said, it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out my spirit Upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants, on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before that great day and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, do you know he quoted this? And I was checking. Do you know that none of the things that he quoted was happening on that day? Eh? The moon did not become dark. Have you noticed that? None of the things that Joe said will happen happened on that day as yet. But yet Peter knew that this thing that is happening to us now is the beginning of Joe's prophecy. And what we are doing is not wrong. What God is doing with us is not wrong. What God is working out in our lives, it may look strange, but it's not wrong. Not every strange thing is wrong. It's strange to you because you don't know it. As if Peter was saying, if Joel were here now, he would have been rejoicing. Because his prophecy is coming to pass. And because this brother stood up and spoke, I thought the crowd would not respond. They responded. What was their response? 
men and brethren, what shall we do? And he did not waste time. What did he do? Repent. Repent, every one of you. What could have ended in verse 30? As mere noise and mere drunkenness became a move of God. I know some, some people who saw our lives when it was nothing. Who thought that this thing will have quenched long ago? One of my friends that we used to conflict with ourselves in Kasnala is my friend. We are friends. He's my good friend now. But we were cat and dog. He's a cat and rat that time. When he preaches like this, you can be sure everything he's preaching is to tear down whatever we have said. One Sunday morning like this in the, in the chapel, he organized and spoke and spoke and spoke. He was quoting this theology. He was quoting this one. He, he said when he went to Calvin, uh, Calvin College of Theology, and this, this, that, that, he said all of that. And the long and short of what he said was to say that the Holy Spirit has passed. Miracles no more happen. Doctors are now the miracle workers. Nobody should listen to all these people that are confusing you. And he finished this meeting in the morning. Sunday morning. I was there. And I went back to my house. The Holy Spirit, I said, Lord, what do I do? He said, what will you do? You stand up and refute error. Preach! That's why you are here. I used to be stubborn. I'm not as simple as you think. <laughs> so you know what I did? I sent a note to all the students. 4 p.m. We are going to deal with the e ecclesiology. You know, I was looking for big words also. <laughs> So the students gathered. They said, Brother Billy is going to teach on church, on church, church matters, and the Holy Ghost. They came. I also invited my friend. He also came. Then I sat and brought the Bible. Whereas he was quoting philosophy and all of that, I started from Genesis. We were searching the Bible. I said, turn to this, turn to this, turn to this. Oh, I thought for about three hours. Everybody was like this. At the end, I said, is there any question? It was explosive. Why did Reverend so and so say this when the Bible said this? I said, let's ask him. <laughs> it was serious. Though. By the time we finished, it was clear. After that meeting, this, my friend, went from house to house. He came back even to Boko to trace the parents of some of my children, students. He said, there's one Yoruba man who has brought Yoruba Metsi. He's confusing your children. As the students were getting back, their parents were confronting them. What is this Yoruba man you are, you are following? Who, who is he? Why is he confusing you? No, we don't agree with what he's doing. News reached me. I also, no problem. I started visiting the parents of the students <laughs> one by one. It was serious. We didn't think we were to be gentle. We insisted that the chapel on that campus 
is going to remain interdenominational. The word of God is going to be preached. The truth is going to be preached. It was always fire for fire. Praise the Lord. But we are friends. I will still go visit him. I said, Reverend, how are you, sir? Say, Mr. Akani, go away. <laughs> I said, No, we are friends. Let's read the Bible. Say, but you didn't go for theology. How can you be contesting with theologian? I said, No, no, no. It's not theology. It's Bible. Are we not reading Bible here? Let's read Bible. One day. I had the privilege of bringing him here. The place was full. And you know, I decided that let me, let me show him that what we are saying is true. So I brought him. I was showing him right. He looked over. Say, Mr. Akane, this thing is not small, though. You mean all these people have continued with all this thing you have been saying? I said, but it's the Bible now. He said, God is working. God is working. Ah, God is working. We just have to be careful. We have to be careful. Ah, God is working. We should not, we should not, we should not oppose the things that God is doing. I said, actually, we should not. <laughs> Brothers, if you agree onto inferiority theory, you will never born. If you allow men to misinterpret what God is doing in your life, you will quench. Sometimes men are deliberate. They want to quench it because they see the capacity of it. They can see what this thing will become if they should allow it to glow. So they want to quench it. Peter refused. Thank God. From that day, thousands were added to the Lord. Thousands were brought to the kingdom. Thousands were baptized. Thousands continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I'm going to stop on this for today. I can assure you that when we come back and we're still looking at bonus, we will now go ahead. What were their activities? What did they do to blow the fire? What did they do that made what God started in them privately to become a mighty move. That will be our beginning point tomorrow. But for tonight, I'd like you to note that every global move of God has a beginning location, sometime in a room, sometime over two or three or four or five people and that those men, those women on whom the fire falls, many, many times, they have no substance, they have no history, they have nothing that anybody could talk about, they are not ancient of days, they were ordinary people. This bonus that God used to spread the fire across the nations, we want to say they were like you. They were like me. And the things that God is doing now is not different from the way he did it before. So I have every reason to believe. And I want you to believe. I want God to strike in your spirit that even you, you are 
a candidate for a move that may spread all over the world. I'm not talking of ambition. I'm not talking of those who want to become a big man. Mm -mm. I don't plan to become a big man. I just want to be a relevant man in the hand of God. I don't want to make a name. But I discovered, praise the Lord, that while we are not struggling to make a name, we will have a name. I discovered that. I discovered that I don't need to make a name. I don't need to introduce myself. I don't need to get big tattoo. I don't need to say I'm a something, something. No. But yet, if what God is doing in your life is correct, it will give you a name. Don't struggle to make a name. The fire will give you a name. Among men. I want to challenge young lives, those of you that are sitting, your life is ahead of you. What will you do with it? The men that shook their generation, they are your age. And it's not incredible that God can start something in Boko. God can start something in this small place. God can start something with few people. God can start something. Somebody was introducing me the other day to another big man in the land. And he decided to be funny. He said, this young man, this young man. Why did they call me young man? Of course. When people know you young, they never saw you grow. Are you understanding? They never saw you grow. They always think where they met you is where you are. They don't know that something is happening to you. They don't know that the Spirit of God is working in your life. They don't know. But while he was talking, while he was trying to intimidate me with what he thought he knew. I don't need to talk. The people he was talking about, talking to, they said, ah! Oh, we know him! Oh, we this! Oh, we this! Well, we do that! I just kept quiet. We don't seek to make a name. But we will have a name. God will give you a name among men in your generation. So we're going to pray on this. Typical bonus of a revival. Ordinary men but who have yielded their lives to God. When others are roaming about they have agreed for God to sit on their lives. When others just want to be careless, they have said, Lord, make my life to count. Do something new with me. When the Holy Ghost will come, he will locate them. And God will locate you. He will locate you. He will bring you to the limelight. Are we okay with that? Can we pray on that? Can we stand before God and say, Lord, now listen to the prayer I want you to pray. <coughs> and if you are convinced you should pray that prayer, let's pray it together. I will, let, I will give you the, the gist of the prayer. Father, it is not incredible. Now I believe that it is not incredible for you to use a man like me. Now I believe that what could, could overwhelm the whole of the land, the whole of the state, the whole of the country, the whole of my nation, it is not incredible that it can start even with the little me. 
Lord, and it is for this reason you have drawn me to yourself for these years. What will hinder you, O oh God, from setting me on fire? That's the kind of prayer I want you to pray tonight. Father, why will I not be one of your bonus in this generation? If I am not too young to be used, why not now? If it is not background, if some of the people you used didn't even know their father, why not me? If they call them barbarians because they were not highly educated and you use them, Father, why not me? If people thought they were confused, they were drunk and they were going to mock them and yet they were the ones that you put your anointing upon and they turn their generation around until today. Why not me? The question tonight is, Father, why not me? Is that, is that a simple prayer enough? I don't know how you will put it. If you cannot pray it in English, pray in your, lang in your language. If you cannot use the words I've used, express it the way it is coming to you. But one thing we should not depart from this meeting with is to go away saying, well, it's for them. I don't think God can be talking about me. Let's pray together. You might stand on your feet now and approach God. Here am I. Use me. Here am I. Use me as the Lord needs somebody. Yarama, use me. Yarama, Yarama, my Lord. Oh, use me as the Lord. Is looking for somebody. Yarama Karoboshi. Oh, Yarama. Yarama, Yarama. As the Lord is looking for somebody, as you are looking for somebody, somebody. Oh, Yarama, use me, Yarama, Marobo Samba Yaba Kando Robo Shinda Yaba Baba, Yaraba Sambo Robo Shinda Mama Mama Masha, Yarama Sambo Robo Shinda Mama Mama Kaurama Samba Robo Shinda Raba Saba. Oh, Yarama. Yarama. Go ahead and say, why not me? Why not me? Is it incredible, God, for you to work with a man like me? Is it incredible for your Holy Ghost to flow through my life? Yiriba samba ya ba 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 sando robo shiba. Yiribo samba raba shanda kataura ba sambo robo shiba ba. Yirima samba raba sambo robo shinda ba 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 ba. Yirima samba raba shanda karobo samba raba samba raba shinda makorobo skor.